Good day, fellow investors. I'm here with Peter Barkling, Head Investment Manager at Niche Master Funds. I was present at their conference yesterday. And one recurring theme that also came out in the previous videos we made is return on capital. And it's also something that Charlie Munger, the most open investors of that, them all who isn't afraid to get hated or something, he keeps telling us return on capital, return on capital, focus on companies that have high return on capital and you have, don't have to focus on anything else. We already mentioned this and we said we'll make a special video and Peter was so kind to make uh, four po points about what return on capital is. So it is an indicator of competitive advantage. Uh, capital net worth accumulates faster due to compound interest. It gen generates cash flows, uh, so shareholder returns, and it offers a high price to book so you reinvest at a good price to book value, which is not the case with companies that have low return on mm -hmm. capital. So those are the four topics that Peter has agreed to go through. So let's start by going through those four okay. topics. Le I'll leave the word to you, it's okay. easier. <laughs> okay, so the first one is uh, really uh, as an indicator of competitive advantage, uh, meaning that it's very easy for a company to say that we have a great competitive advantage, but we don't make any money. Uh, and, and then, of course, you know there's no logic. So if a company's competitive advantage is more than just wishy-washy uh, talk, uh, then it must lead to higher return on capital. That means also that if we find a company that has a high return on capital, and it has so consistently over the years, then it must indicate that there is a competitive advantage because if not, either the theory wouldn't work or there wouldn't be any barriers to entry, competitors would have taken it away. So that's the first thing. High returns on capital indicates in itself is a, is a measure of quality. That's, that's the first one, that's easy. Now the second one is actually the most powerful concept in investing, which is compound interest. So if you buy anything and it compounds, meaning it gives you a return of say 10%, then you buy, you pay 100, then you get 110, then it's 121, and then it moves on like that. It's not 120 in the third year, it's 121 because the 10% of the 10%, the compounding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, if you buy a 30% return on capital company, it compounds much, much faster. And if at 40 and 50% you are talking, I mean, fa much faster rates of compounding. Those companies are more expensive, of course, unless nobody has found out, but they usually have. Uh, but the value this leads to is, is uh, I hesitate to say exponential, but it is exponentially higher than just the, the, the fact that the, the return on capital, when that moves from 10% to 20%, the, the company's value more than doubles, okay, because of the compounding effect. When it moves to 4%, it, it gets, again, many times bigger. So that's the second point. Uh, ca uh, capital or net worth accumulates faster. And how can we, so even if we invest, so the price is usually higher of those companies, and so we invest in that capital, but the underlying capital will actually compound, which means that also the price of the stock will compound at the same rate or it's not linear? Uh, that depends on the market. When the market sees that oh, yeah, this company's profits are growing much faster than, then the market tends to reward that. Not always on a one-on-one -on -one basis and sometimes uh, we have to wait for it. Until the value gets unlocked. Yes, right exactly. Okay. Uh, but the market tends to always find out that oops, this company's dividends are growing and growing and growing and so we better, uh, I mean, pe more people get interested in the company, they buy it and that drives the price up. So that's And the big difference here, I think you showed the chart yesterday of about the compounding and differences of 10%, 20% and 30%. Yes. The key is here to just buy that such a company and be patient and let it compound, let, let it, it do it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That, of course, there's a limit to how much you should pay for it, but, but uh, certainly a, a, a company that has a 30% return on capital versus one uh, or is more than three times more valuable than one that only has 10%. What would be that limit? How much you should pay? Uh, that's where it gets... Uh, <laughs> that's what everybody wants to yeah, know. Yeah, but that's okay. Uh, that's fair. Uh, so that's why you need to go back and say, okay, so you have something that is compounding at 40% a year. Now that will be pretty hard to sustain for a very long time. 
So you have to go back and ask, what is it in the business of this company that allows it to, to compound for 40% a year? Does the market really continue to grow? And because it will require a bigger and bigger market. And, and, and some markets you will see, well, maybe if it is a certain type of hospital equipment, once every hospital has this type of equipment, the market will be done. And so you need to understand that. And, and, and so th that's the only way you can really say, how much can we pay for it? Because if something compounds at 40% per year forever, then it doesn't matter what you pay for it. Oh, you know, yeah, so, yeah. Some, somebody uh, w once commented that, what would have happened if Jesus had put one dollar in the bank at the year zero? Um, and, uh, the, and you tried to do it in your, on your uh, pocket calculator and you will quickly find that it errors because even at, at just a 5% interest rate, one dollar at 5% since the year zero is more money in, than in the entire world at the moment. Uh, so, so in other words, of course, at some point it stops. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that is what you need to understand. That's why you need to understand the business. 40% won't last forever. It can last for a long time, but not forever. Uh, so that's what you put into, okay, what's the price? So you as, try to estimate, okay, for how long can this go on? Yes. Will it slow down? At what rate? At what rate let's hit, hit peak? And what will then be the dividends, for yes. example, for yeah. uh, exactly. investors? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes, uh, makes so, sense. So well, you have to then go back into the qualitative analysis. It's no longer just calculations yeah, and yeah, spreadsheets. Yeah, yeah. It's really understanding is where does this money come from? So, All right. Yeah. Thank you. So, so that's so the second one. The, the third one was that um, the higher the return on capital, the more cash flow a company generates. The reason being that, especially a growing company, if a company with a low return on capital grows very fast, then it needs to spend, if not all, then almost all of its profits to reinvest in the business. And that means there's nothing left for investors. The company gets bigger and bigger and the profits get bigger and bigger, but the cash flow doesn't. So there's nothing I think we have sense. to differentiate here. The company usually shows extremely high operating cash flows. Yes. But then we have to minus the capital expenditures. Yes. And then exactly. we get to free cash flow, which exactly. is what you are and talking about. And it's the free about. cash flow I'm talking. Yes, free that's cash correct. Flow, so that's correct, Sven. And because the free cash flow is what the company can use to buy bank shares and to pay dividends and to make acquisitions if they want. All, or to reinvest, but then if it but is... But it's already reinvested. Reinvested, yeah, the yeah, CapEx yeah, yeah, is yeah, already yeah. reinvested. So it's after that CapEx level. And if you have a company that makes a very high return on capital, then it follows by definition that as it grows, it needs less capital as new investment. And uh, the remaining cash that has been generated is free and can be used to pay dividends, pay, buy back shares, or, or do something entirely different. Or pay back a debt if the company has any debt. Would you dare to give us an example? What would be now a company that an investor that is looking for such a company or that you have in your fund would fit those criteria? I mean, pretty much every, all of our largest positions in the, in the well, pretty much all the investments in our uh, fund ha has that profile because it is so crucial to us. Mm -hmm. Because without cash flow, it's all a dream about what will happen in the future. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we want, uh, company, we want companies that are already generating cash so flow. So your fund is practically uh, something that represents, okay, we are buying great businesses with, that's generating yes, cash flows yes. from shareholders, which means that you're investing in a business and the business is actually what provides the return to your yes, investment. Yes, that's correct. And, uh, I mean, you asked for an example, Decfi we talked about yesterday generates more and more cash every year and has been for the last 15 years at least. And what is, yeah. now, for example, what are the valuations if an investor sees Decra now, what does he have to pay for that? Right now they are paying, the, the, I think uh, at my last check, uh, the price earnings ratio, if you use that as valuation, is, a, is a 22 or thereabouts. Okay. Price book value may be, I have to check that, but may, uh, certainly at least five. Um, but here comes there, and then I can take that and lead that to the fourth All point, right. which is the great thing about when you have a company with a high return on capital, uh, it tends also, when investors find out, to get a high book value. Mm -hmm. However, if the book value is, is 
price to book value is five times. That means that you pay more than five times the capital that what is in the company. Let's say a value investor, like the basic grand value investors, would not to do because that's not a yes. value that would not be a value from a book perspective but that's for, because in graham's time uh, valuations were much lower and we have seen later buffett and munger yes. completely change their strategy yes. from graham and cigar butts to what we are talking yes. here yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah but here's the here's the neat thing about it though is that if a company like dekra deserves a price book of five or even eight even ten many pharmaceuticals are at, at more than ten the profit that you make that is not paid out to you as dividends but that stays in the company gets reinvested at a price book ratio of one. Yeah. The, you see that the, yeah, the effect yeah, yeah. That, that in itself is a compounding effect that the more the, the company makes the more you invest indirectly at a price book of one uh, but it actually has a value a market value of price book of eight and that helps to drive up the share price very, very fast sometimes. Yeah, uh, uh, so if Decra <coughs> continues to yeah. do that over the next 10 years, or what are your expectations? For how much does Decra actually make in cash flows? Uh, how much did it make the last year? About uh, 60, 60 million uh, British pounds at that free cash flow free cash before flow. So acquisitions. Yes. With their return on capital, where do you see the free cash flow? Of course, this is just an estimation, but in 10 years. Well, <laughs> that's a dangerous game, but uh, I can tell you that uh, 10 years ago it was like 10 or 15, so it has again quintrupled. So it has quadrupled, and the stock price is, followed probably. Uh, the stock price has totally so followed, yes. Th with the same fundamentals, the return on capital, it is possible that it does the same over the next 10 years. If the company keeps growing, if it doesn't bump into something, yes. And things never go as planned in of this course, business. That's why sometimes they go better than planned. That's, and, and that's why you are not putting all your money exactly, in Exactly, yes, yes. How yes. many companies do you have in your fund? We have 25 at the moment and, and that's a few too many. So we aim at, uh, I think the optimal is about 20. 20, all right. Yeah, because we want to be able to really follow them closely. And then them, so. if something goes wrong or the management does something or the return on capital or it gets eaten away by the competition, you, what you can, you probably, you don't lose much because there are still valuable companies, but we, on a 10 year basis, now when I'm comparing this, it's the ones that do good go up four times and the ones that don't go, do good probably don't lose much in the long term or th so it doesn't when i'm putting this into the long term performance the you ne only need practically a few winners that will keep doing yes, that yes that's true and that's that true. will make great returns uh, yeah, that's true but uh, it's, it's actually uh, somebody else has also pointed out that uh, in in practice it turns out to be more important to avoid losers okay so if you can only avoid the worst losers so we sp spend a lot of time trying to wean out the losers uh, because the others, you can't really predict. It's easier to predict failure, that's another thing, than to predict All right. uh, success because success is almost always a result of somebody really brilliant that you don't know. Yeah, uh, uh, whereas failure is, you, you, can s you can see when companies make classic mistakes, uh, too broad diversification, too fast internationalization too broad a product line. All these things I mean, we know from business school. As I'm here, I'm going to seize this opportunity. I think okay. we have a topic for another video, okay. right. which is how to avoid value traps and how to avoid losers and that definition of discussion on the definition of value investing, what it actually is, because it's vague, I think, in the perspective of investors. Well, thank you, Peter, for this perfect explanation on what return on capital is, how it works when it comes to investing. And investors, viewers uh, will see us uh, in the next video talking about value and the dangers of value investors and how we define that. Well, sure. Thank you.